Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hoop. This is our regular weekly message. And today we'll be continuing our series called Faith Revisited. We took a two-week Easter interlude so that we could accommodate Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. And today we're going to pick back up where we left off. This is part seven of our um, series, Faith Revisited. So I hope that everybody had a good Easter and they had good stuff to eat and that they remembered the Lord and what he did for us on Calvary 2,000 years ago. So with that said, let us jump right into our message. It's entitled, Building Faith. Turn with me please to our scripture found in Mark chapter four, verse 21 through 25. And he said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not understand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use it, it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And for the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Jesus had just finished telling the parable of the sower, which we dissected already, so we won't bore you with those details. Then, right after he said that, he said, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or to be put under a bed? And he said, nothing that is hidden will stay hidden because it cannot stay hidden. And we went into detail with that as well. So I want to pick up where we left off the last time in verse 24. So let us just reread verse 24 and 25 so that we can get a starting point. Verse 24, and he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. As we mentioned the last time, hearing is so important that first Jesus said, be careful how you hear. Now he is saying, pay attention to what you hear. Don't you find that that is a little bit peculiar, somewhat peculiar for Jesus to say, say something like that? First, be careful how, how you hear. Then he says, pay attention to what you hear. So it would appear that there is a how to hear, which we covered already, but I think it's, it's important enough for us to refresh ourselves. We wanna talk about that again. We wanna dig those bones up one more time, so to speak. Now the word of God is living and active. Therefore, it cannot lie dormant. It cannot lie inactive. It must be stirred up within us. How do we receive the word of God? Through hearing. Once we receive the word, then we must, we must, we must mix it with hopistus, the faith, and put it into action. We put it into action through word and deed. In other words, we live what we preach and we preach what we live. No one hides a lamp under a bowl, but rather he puts it on a stand so that the whole room can be lit and those in the room can now benefit from its light. 
is the same principle in the parable of the mustard seed. You see, when that mustard seed is fully grown, it grows into the largest of all the garden plants and the birds of the air come and they rest and they make nest in its branches. It benefits all. Jesus declared that there is a right way and a wrong way to hear. And that's why he solemnly uh, warned us to be careful how we hear. When we study the Greek, we find that there are two types of hearing. One where we let sound or where we let words pass through our air canal and it goes right out the other air canal. These words are meaningless to the hearer because they did not meet, those words did not meet, or they were not mixed with hopistus, the faith. It is as the, as the saying goes, my words fell on deaf ears. Therefore, it was of no benefit to those who heard. Then there is a right way to hear. It is the hearing that is both present and active, as well as past and active. When a word is spoken to us, we immediately receive the word, like the fourth hearer in the parable of the sower. And then it is immediately mixed with whole pistis, the faith. And it produces a harvest of a hundredfold. Now, that brings us to what we hear. Is there a choice with what we hear? Well, apparently it is. Jesus said, be careful with what you hear. Therefore, it is quite possible to be careful with what we hear. In the explanation of hearing that we just explained above, we learn that we can control how we hear. And if we can control how we hear, then it is quite possible for us to control what we hear. How do we um, control what we hear? When someone speaks a word over us that, that um, equates to a curse, or the word does not line up with the word that you receive, or it does not resonate in your spirit, then you let it go. You do not mix it with faith. Here is what I mean. Paul was writing to the Galatian Christians because they had heard another message. First they heard his message, and they put his message to truth. They had mixed it with Ohopistus, the faith, and they were acting out their faith. They were working their faith out with much fear and trembling. Now they have heard another word from somebody else, and they were separating them from the message of faith. So they mixed the new message with faith, and they started to act on this new but wrong message. So they were not watching what they heard because they didn't weigh it against Scripture. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 2 through 5. Paul writes to them, Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so much things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? In his reprimand, Paul mentions hearing with faith twice. In those four verses, he mentions it twice. He's trying to bring them back to what they heard. The problem was not how. The problem was what. They were mixing the wrong hearing with faith. We cannot get away from mixing hearing with faith. It's always faith and hearing hearing and faith. The two cannot be separated. That's why faith comes by hearing. 
I want us to return to that portion of scripture found in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Notice that this faith comes through the word of Christ and not through the word of God. I realize that some versions like the KGV translates it God. And that's why when we quote this verse, we normally say through the word of God. But if we look at the Greek in the ESV, it is not the word of God, theos, but rather it is the word of Christ, Christos, that Paul wrote. There is a big difference. I believe Paul was being very precise when he wrote Christos instead of Theos. First, you must have a personal relationship with Jesus in order to receive the word of Christ. The word of God is the Logos meaning the whole scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The word of God, that is logos, is a general word, and it is told that everyone, everybody, this word is to whomsoever. For example, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. That word is for Everyone, whomsoever will. If you hear and you want, you can come and you can receive life. It is for you. It is for me. It is for us. It is for our families. While the word of Christ is a rhema word, meaning it is a now word. Rhema is a specific word to a specific person about a specific thing or a specific event in a specific time period. For example, the announcement of Christ. That was a specific event that's making it a rhema word that was spoken to the shepherds, which was a specific person, or in that case, specific persons. The Savior has been born. So now we have two Greek words, logos and rhema. For the one English word, word. The one is the word of God, the other is the word of Christ. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. You see, times gone by, God spoke to us through the prophets. And thus, we have logos. But in these days, these last days, God speaks to us through his son, Jesus Christ, who gives us a rhema word for our situations. Rhema is so important that it is not the logos or the idle words that we have to give account for, as mentioned by Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. But it's every inactive, in, inoperative, impotent, unemployed rhema that we have to give an account for. It goes back to the servant with the ten talents, as well as the first three hearers in the parable of the sower. We cannot speak idle words and expect to move in miracles. Therefore, we must be very careful when we say the Lord said or the Holy Spirit said. If they have indeed not spoken, God does not take that lightly. Look at Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 28. And her prophets have smeared white wash for them, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, Thus says the Lord God, when the Lord has not spoken. Many people claim that the Holy Spirit said such and such, or I heard the Lord say thus and thus, or the Holy Spirit told me to tell you. When in their, it's their own imaginations, 
that have gotten them to say that the Lord has done this. We have to be very careful when we say that the Lord or the Holy Spirit said this or that. Because God is not pleased when we see false visions and hear false words. We are required to learn the difference between our thoughts or the thoughts of the enemy and the voice of our Lord and Savior, our Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. We will not be held innocent for not recognizing his voice and blaming him for something he did not say. For Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. We recognize the voice of Jesus and thus receive a rhema word from him. So, so now, how do we build our faith? Well, according to the Hebrew writer, it comes through the rhema word of Christ. I want to use an illustration from the Old Testament. It's found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 14 through 20. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, son of Jael, son of Mataniah, the Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the accent of Zis. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Juriel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them and the Lord will be with you. Please understand that a great multitude of Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Mennonites were coming up to do battle against, against King Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was terrified. He and all Jerusalem with him. So he set his face to seek the Lord by proclaiming a fast throughout Judea. And the whole Judean assemble, or all Judah assembled to seek and help him seek the face of God to help them in the situation that they were now facing. Then Jehaziel received a rhema word in the midst of all of that. He received this rhema word from the Lord. He said, this is what the Lord says. Listen up, people. God has spoken to me, and this is what he has said. And he proceeded to tell them what he had just heard from the Lord. Okay, let us continue with verse 18 to see how that was received. Verse 18. Then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites of the Kohathites and the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. The rhema word that they had, had, had heard, they had just heard, was immediately received and immediately acted upon. They did not debate it. They did not go out and form a committee to discuss it and to, to determine the accuracy of the rhema word. They heard it. They recognized who it came from because it resonated with them. They accepted it. They immediately put it into action. They began to worship. They began to praise. And then they began to give thanks for God's deliverance, for his deliverance of his people. But I want to point something out to you. Jehoz, uh, or Jehaziel was not a Johnny come lately, so to speak. He was not a wishy-washy man. He was not a stranger amongst friends. They knew him, and they knew his daddy, and they knew his daddy's daddy, and they knew his daddy's daddy daddy. They knew him to be a credible man. 
Therefore, the rhema word was received, accepted, and mixed with ohopistus, the faith, and then they celebrated it. They celebrated the word that they had gotten. My sheep hear my voice, the good book says. If Jehaziel was in the habit of saying, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord had not spoken to him at all, do you think that the congregation would have put their trust in the words that he had spoken, that they would have believed that he had now heard from God in such dire time as this, when they were facing such a huge army? Probably not. Let us see what happened next. Did they let the word of God lie dormant? After receiving it? Or did they immediately put it in action? Let us see. Verse 20. And they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets and you will succeed. I want to say, I want to read that one more time. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets and you will succeed. To me, that is one of the greatest recorded acts of faith. Faith in a ring of word. And that is just in my humble opinion. But I believe that that is one of the greatest recorded acts of faith in a ring of word that I've read. I'm sure there are others, and I can name others, like David and other people. But this one, this one is one of my favorites. I mean, David always sought the, the face of God, and he received a rhema. So that was like second nature to King David. King Jehoshaphat and all Judah recognized what? They heard. They received or they recognized that it came from the Lord. Far too often, people are led astray by their own desire because they confuse it with a word from God. They want it so badly that, they, that their desire seems to come from God when God indeed has not spoken. It is really important that we understand this because of the next verse that Jesus spoke. This is what he said. He said, be careful what you hear. And it's because of this. Look at Mark chapter 4, verse 24 through 25. And this is Jesus speaking. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear with the measure you use it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you for to the one who has more will be given and from the one who has not even what he has will be taken away pay attention to what you hear because the measure you use it it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. It is hard to put everything into a word that you are not sure that you can trust. If you can't trust it, do you want to put everything you've got behind it? It's, it's difficult. So that's the reason why Jesus said, pay attention to what you hear. Not every word is for you. Maybe it is not you that the Lord is prompting to sow that thousand dollar seed. Maybe it's your neighbor sitting next to you. Or maybe it's your neighbor on the opposite row from you. But if it is you that God is speaking to, you had better do it. Because it's better to obey than to sacrifice. Again, this is the servant with the five talents who turned it into ten talents. It is the fourth hearer who received a hundredfold. The flip side is this. If you receive a ream of word and do not mix it with Ohopistus, the faith, and you do not act on it, it will be taken away from you and given to him who already has. 
How long before this happens? Well, I really don't know. Because God is a merciful and patient God. He is very, very gracious, not wanting anyone to fail. He wants everybody to be a winner. But nonetheless, from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and given to him who already has, and then he will have even more. Whether it is here and now or in the judgment, it will come to pass. For the one who uses ohopistis, or hopistis, the faith, with the measure that he is given, it will be measured back to him, and still more will be added. I want to return to Jehoshaphat. He and his whole army set out on the word of one prophet. This was not a small thing, nor was it a minor matter. If they got this one wrong, it meant that they would forfeit their own lives. They would forfeit the lives of their loved ones and they would lose their country. They would lose their sovereignty at the least. So this is considered a great leap of faith to believe that the Lord would and could do all that he said he would do through that prophet. I want us to take a look at what was the first thing that King Jehoshaphat did. It is not what you think. So let us pick it up in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 21 through 23. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and sang. Give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoted them to destruction. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. See, the king, King Jehoshaphat, did not send out spies into the enemy's camp to spy out to see what they, that their next move was going to be. Nor did he set up battle lines. Nor did he arrange his, his artillery of long bows in the back to volley arrows upon the unsuspecting enemy. He doesn't even set a plan B just in case. Just in case Brother Jehaziel had gotten it wrong. He did not set a plan B. What he did was, after taking counsel with the people, he appointed singers, praise and worship leaders in holy attire to go before the army. These were not men who were all tatted up and looking like the world with their pants hanging off. They were not dressed in their torn up jeans and worn out t-shirts, nor were they dressed in their Bermuda shorts and shoeless with toes grabbing the grass and flipping turd dirt with their big toes. No, they were dressed in their Sunday best, not in their Sunday worst. It was holy attire, singing, Give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. I want you to understand something. The word Judah means praise, or praise Yahweh. Now, Am, um, Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are always associated with the occult. They're always associated with idol worship. They were always hostile to Judah. Judah were singers. Judah were worshipers. Judah were praisers. That was who they were. So 
These men of Ammon, Moab, and Malseer came to steal or to conquer the praise of the people of God. And what was the first thing that King Jehoshaphat did? He ordered a praise and worship team dressed in holy attire to sing praise and to give thanks to the Lord. Understand that when the enemy comes against you, his aim is to first steal your praise. He comes to steal your worship. He comes to steal your thanksgiving. He, his will is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And when the enemy draws up his battle lines against you, begin to praise, begin to worship the Lord. Put on worship music, put on praise music, and begin to sing your little heart out and watch what God will do for you. Try it and see. Now, let us see what the Lord did for Judah when they began to sing and praise and worship. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 22 through 23. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose up against inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoted them to destruction, and when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. The Lord routed them, and they destroyed each other. God will always respond to your praises. He will always respond to worship. Psalms 22 verse 3 tells us that God inhabits or remains or dwells in the praises of Israel. And of Israel, ours as well. Since we are the bride and the body of Christ, he will inhabit our praises as well. Now, our last point for the... Re for the reason why we need to pay attention to what we hear is this. Let us read Mark chapter 4, verse 24 through 25. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. For the measure of faith that we use, God will measure back to us in rewards and then pay us interest on top of that on our investment. For still more will be added to you. Let us take a look at, at how King Jehoshaphat and Judah was, record, uh, was rewarded for marching out in deep, deep, deep faith. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 24 and 25. When Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked towards the horde, and behold, there were dead bodies lying on the ground. None had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found among them in great numbers clothes, goods, and precious things which they took for themselves until they could carry no more. They were three days taking the spoil. It was so much. We don't have time to dissect all of that. It will have to suffice for us to say that when they looked out in the midst of praise, they saw that the thing that once was a threat was a threat no more. The horde was so overwhelmed and, uh, and deadly that, that they were afraid that they were, were, were going to die and their families were going to die and their, their city overtaken. But that horde, that overwhelming horde that was so deadly was now dead themselves. And the spoil was just there for the taken. Even more will be added a hundredfold plus interest. The spoil was so great that it took them three days to collect it all. Why so great? Because the faith that they measured was great. The spoil equaled the faith that was used. I want to say that again. The faith, the Ohopestus, 
that Judah used was so great that it was rewarded with a hundredfold spoil plus interest. It was so much that it took them three days to carry it all away. Why three days? Because three is the number of eternity. Our now faith will be our rewards throughout eternity. That's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, But the Son of Man having come, shall he find the faith upon the earth. This is Young's literal translation, translated into Greek exactly as it is written, exactly the way Jesus said it, and exactly the way Jesus expressed it, exactly the way that Jesus meant it. Will he find the faith, hopistus, upon the earth? He will be looking for what he can accredit to your eternal account. So that you don't go into eternity broke. What did Judah do next? Did they grab the money and run? Like so many Christians do. They're down. They're out. They're praying. The church prays for them. And God blesses them tremendously. And they grab the money and they, they, they run. Did, 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 did Jehoshaphat and Judah do that? Well, let's see. Let's find out. I believe it's a lesson of instruction for us as well. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 26 and 28. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Baraka. For there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the valley of Baraka to this day. Then they returned, every man of Judah, everyone, everyone, every man, of Judah and every man of Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat at their head, King Jehoshaphat, returning to Jerusalem with joy for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. They came to Jerusalem with harps and lyres and trumpets to the house of the Lord. Again, time does not permit us to go deep into this, but only to say that the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies and they broke out the, the, the musical instruments. They broke out the praise. They broke out the worship. They brought out the worship leaders dressed in holy attire, all headed to the house of the Lord to worship. In other words, they began to have church, a good old time camp meeting. The next time that the enemy comes against you, the next time he tries to steal your praise by stealing your joy. Turn on the worship music. Turn on the praise and worship and begin to sing. Begin to worship. Begin to pray. The Lord will answer. And if he answers, he will indeed reward. But you have to obey. Try it. It works. I was so discouraged a few weeks ago, but I did not lose my praise. And God sent someone very near and dear to us to encourage me. And she didn't even know that the enemy had come in and tried to steal my joy, tried to steal my praise, but he could not have it. So how do we build faith? We must first hear a rhema word. The rhema can come from the Holy Spirit straight to us or through someone else or through something else. It can also come from the Logos word of God. When you read God's word, he will speak to you. Sometimes you are praying and a verse will come to you. Sometimes it is a known verse and sometimes it is not a known verse. But either way, it is the word of God. You see, that happened to me during our last fast, our fast in January. I was praying, and I got a word while I was praying. I thought it was my mind speaking to me, but that nagging would not leave me alone. I thought to myself, okay, I got this, this, this verse. I'm, I'm going to look it up when I finish praying. I'm not going to stop praying to go look this up. But the feeling would not leave me. And the feeling felt like, if I don't go and look it up now, I'm going to forget 
this, uh, this address of this, this um, verse that I got. And so I stopped praying and I went and I looked at the verse and it was the exact answer to the exact thing that I was praying about. So God still speaks to his people. After we receive the rhema word, then we must, must, must mix it with faith. That strong belief that the word spoken to us and that it is the word for us and that that word was spoken over us will come to pass since God spoke it. Then we must put put that and couple it, or we must take that and couple it with faith and put it into action, just like King Jehoshaphat and Judah did. Remember, nothing is impossible for him who believes. So, I want to ask you this. Do you have that kind of faith? Do you have that kind of faith in God? Let me ask you another question. Do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Because if you don't, you can. God has made it very, very easy for each one of us to know him. Because he loves us. He loves you. He loves me. He loves your family. And he loves my family. And he wants the best for us. He wants us to live in eternity with him. But we've got to have faith. We've got to put our faith in action. So if you don't know who Jesus is, if you don't know him as Lord and Savior, say this prayer with me. Believe it. Believe it with your heart. Say it with your mouth. Believe it with your heart. The Lord will hear. And if he hear, he will forgive. Repeat the prayer. Heavenly Father, Forgive me of my sins. I ask you to increase my faith. Give me boldness and confidence to stand on your word. Even if no one else is standing, help me to stand. Help me to believe. Thank you, Jesus, for coming. Thank you for dying. I accept your free gift. I apply the blood of Jesus to my soul. Thank you for washing away my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is get a Bible. You gotta get a Bible. You gotta get a word. You gotta read that logos. Read it. Study it. Uh, and memorize it. Commit it to, 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 to your heart. Commit it to memory. So that when you are attacked, when the devil comes against you, when you're down, when you're depressed, when when you're in a jam, you can recall those words and says, Thus saith the Lord, it is written. And you will be an overcomer. Then find a Bible-believing church. Not one of those progressive churches who embraces the world and embraces the things of the world. But one of those who have kept themselves away from the things. Not, not, I'm not talking about some seclusion. I'm talking about a church who do not embrace the evil of today. But the one that teaches righteousness, holiness. Join that church. One who still believes in faith that God still does miracles. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you. We love you and the Lord loves you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.